morning, South Africa, and good morning to our dear audience. My name is Mawande and my surname is Nongeni. I'll be the facilitator for this pre-SONA youth panel discussion on some of the issues that are pertaining the youth and that are very pressing to us. Now, the main idea and the purpose of the session is to try and elevate the youth's voice. We're trying to concentrate and give attention on youth-based data so that we can attempt to fill the information gap that exists between the youth and our government and our corporate. And what we want to do in overall is to contribute to the youth, to a youth enabling environment. Now on my far left, I am joined by Ms. Lerato Mate. And then on my left, I am joined by Mr. Johan Koza. And then on my near right, I have Onale Namsongo. And then on my far, on my far right, I have Sisanda April. So for the purpose of the discussion of, this, of today, Day, we will be focusing on the youth more based and more primarily because as it stands in our current statistics of South Africa with the 58.8 million people plus and counting, we have the elderly at 9%, we have the adults at 27.1%, we have children at 28.8%, and the majority of our population stands at 35.1%. So it goes without saying that the South Africans should be more more youth focused and we should be given platforms to engage with people. Now we have our areas of focus being on education, gender-based violence, unemployment and the fourth industrial revolution. And just to give a background overview before we start on our discussion on education, we will be looking at what has been happening um, at, on the statistics where we are give, we are submitted that where it is submitted that approximately 3.3 million of our 10 of our young people aged from 15 to 24 were not in employment were not in education and were not in training in the previous year so i would like miss lerato mate to just tell us where are our young people in the space um in the space our young people are just lost in a way um I feel like government is trying to meet our young people halfway. We just have to work with government in order to achieve that goal. So um, we can, it's achievable, actually it's achievable, but we just have to work with government. We just have to meet government halfway in order for us to achieve that goal. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sander, we understand that according to the stats, the young children are not in education and they are not in training as well but we do have um, primary phase, we do have intermediate phase, senior phase, and higher education and training. So how is a 15-year-old reaching to a 24-year-old not in all of these academic spaces? Um, I think that our education system needs a lot of change. Our education system needs to be flexible. We cannot only box children into one into one box thinking that everyone is going to be in academia. Not everyone is going to be in academia. We need um, a, a, an education system that's going to allow children to pursue who they are. We need an education system that's not going to want to mold children into certain beings. We need to understand that skills are needed and they need to start from from foundation phase you know there are there are a lot of scarce skills that we are struggling with in the country right now and it all boils down to our education system so if we can then make our education system flexible in order to be able to produce different kinds of children who will fill different kinds of fields because now it is so rigid that it's only focused on theory and we forget that not every child is going to to do well with theory because we have children who are gifted in certain areas and our education system needs to be strong enough to to place these children where they are best at and i feel like right now currently that's um, where our education is is not doing so well. Mm. Um, so what I get, Johan, from Sisanda's submission is that our education system is not individually centered and it is not personalized. So how can we go um, about changing all of that and trying to make sure that personalities are harnessed by our education system and that different talents from different candidates and individuals who are in the in education institutions um, get the best out of them? Yeah, like Sesanda said, that uh, 
the, the one basket approach is not working for us. We need to, to, to have a program where it can be able to empower skills. Children from the early as a primary or preschool level, they must be able to be identified based on the skills, empowered based on the skills. Now we're using a one basket approach that all of us must be there in the system until you reach out of metric. When out of metric is when now you must able to decide that you, either you can run or you can swim. Mm -hmm. Then when you decide that you can swim, find that you can't able to make it, then you must swift it to running. Mm -hmm. And find that in the, in the running is not your own expertise again. Then now you must swift to something else. So those gap that young people, they are not in, it's because the system is, is pressuring us to, to focus on physics and maths. Find that my expertise is not there in physics and maths. They must be able to push to make sure that it allow uh, young people to, 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 be, to, to empower their own skills mm -hmm. where they are. Because if you can able to decide while you are still in the primary level in terms of base of the skills, it's easy to elevate it fast and able to exceed in all because you are expecting that field. Mm -hmm. But now if we are forced to do something that we are not expected to eat, it's difficult to adapt. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the system must be able to, to allow it because checking at Zimbabwe, <coughs> Zimbabwe is one of the, 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 the strongest in terms of education or the best in Africa in terms of education. Most of those in Zimbabwe, when they, they are moving out of metric before they're being certified in any institutions, they can able to do their own work in terms of skills. Whenever now they migrate to any country, they can do any work. Mm -hmm. But as when you are out of metric, that means it's the end of the road for you, unless you go to Tesha to be certified for something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what Mr. Johan Anna Lena is talking about is career uncertainty. That people spend a lot of time in the education system and when they're going um, post matric, they find out that they're really not certain about what they want to do. So we have foreign exchange programs as an example, so that we can try and analyze and scan what's happening around the world and then we can just bring those people back and then add to our skills. We want to diversify our education system and we want to have not only just quality but quantity of curriculums that we can offer. So do you feel like the foreign exchange program is the best route so to, for us to understand what's happening out there and how we can implement trying to have a diverse curriculum? Well, Mawande, uh, foreign exchange, the foreign exchange prob uh, program could be a way for us to, let, to expose our youth to new ideas and show them how the world is working apart from South Africa. Now, the problem is uh, access to information. Not everybody has the resources to go on the internet and actually find out about these foreign exchange programs mm -hmm. and how you can apply for them. So what we need to do actually is we need to run campaigns whereby we go to every school, each and every school in South Africa, and interest these learners in these programs. Mm -hmm. Let them even know from a primary level that when you get to high school, these are the options that you might have. You don't have to do your high school in South Africa, try to get uh, approved to go into the foreign exchange program and see if you can go and explore other options out there. Thank you. Well, in respect to everything that we have submitted, I think there's one problem that we haven't um, tackled with, and that's the issue of funding. Yes, we do get to primary, we do get to high school, we do get to post metric. But can you tell us what's wrong with the funding? Because there have been persistent protests in South Africa regarding the youth and funding. I understand that um, South Africans, out of the goodness of, uh, of their hearts, they do um, they do help out people in terms of crowdfunding when people are really asking for money. And South Africans do give out uh, to give out help. But what's wrong there? Can you just take us through that, Miss Lerato? Um, there is funding, first thing, but what's wrong is you find that a student maybe enrolls in, she, maybe he or she wants to study to be a doctor, and you find out she is not really that passionate about do uh, being a doctor. So I feel like um, sometimes government funds people that are not really sure about what they really want to do. So I think young people should be really sure about what is it that I want to do. What is it that I want, I'm passionate about? So let's focus on passion more than I want to please my parents, I want to do this because my parents says I should do this. Thank you. Yeah. So overall, what we've discussed in, in education is that 
career uncertainty is brought about by having an education system that is not individual and personal is personal based that we need a talent based approach into education so that people can understand what they want to do into the near future and we've is Ms. Lerato has said that um, career uncertainty also costs us as the t uh, cost taxpayers and it also costs and delays a lot of time. So I think with that being covered, we can just go into post-education now, which is the staggering and out and the one thing that we want to talk about as the young people and that is unemployment. So I'd just like to read out from this fact sheet something that has been written that people of the ages of 15 to 24 have a total unemployment rate of 58.1%. That's a 0.1 decrease from the from from quarter three. And then the total unemployment rate stands at 35.6% from the people aged 25 to 34. And that's a 0.5 decrease. We do understand that it these are very, very small numbers, but how can the government leverage on the decrease and how can we just make sure that we maintain this trend that we're, that we're starting, Mr. Sandra? On unemployment, I think it's the, it's the small things that make a big difference. So for instance, if graduates are then complaining about when you are looking for a job, there's requirements to have a license or there's requirements to have a, a license and a car. That on its own is excluding you from being employed. That's an exclusionary on its own. So if then government can put forward policies in both the private and the, and the, and the government sector to say that these requirements are not fair because the very same child that's looking for a job was funded by NASFAS throughout their high school. So how do you then forget the inequality in South Africa and expect um, a, a student to have, to have a license or to have a car and they're fresh out of university? So those small, those small, um, those small things can make a huge difference. Thank you very much, Ms. Mr. Sander. Um, Brother Johan, what she's telling us here is the, the this paradox that's called the catch-22. So in order for you to get something, you must have something that you previously couldn't attain. So it's very difficult to maneuver through that. But I understand that the government scrapped out um, work experience um, when you want to look for a job. Do you think that it's helping and it's what would account to the unemployment being lowered for graduates um, aged 24 to 23? Because I think that those are the ages where people start to get experience and they're post um, and they're out of university. Yes, yes, Maonda. Um, the, the issue of experience, the cut off of the issue of experience it, in the entry level post, it does help a lot, uh, as you can see the number. But to deal actually with the number, the government have to go extra miles mm -hmm. because if you can check now, it shows that the universities they are producing um, the, the, what the corporate world cannot able to utilize. Mm -hmm. So it means that now the government must sit down with the corporate world mm -hmm. or with the investors, say, look, we are producing people or which skills that you want, mm -hmm. so they can come back and say, you go to universities or and sit down and say, look. We want you to produce this kind of skills to the people, to the people, and then we are going to fund you like this. Also, the corporate world can able to come uh, halfway there in terms of assisting with bursaries. But now the government is funding, funded more the funding the way a uh, lot of people graduate in terms of those skills. But the corporate world does not as accept those skills or doesn't want those skills. Now the corporate world will be forced to take people from the outside, not here, and hence the. the the number, if we can check the, with the last quarter, there's only a slight changes in terms of unemployment. So I think government must be able to, able to, to, to play and close this gap between the corporate world and also the higher education so that they can able to know what the corporate world, world actually skills or expertise they want. So they can able to university produce what the, the corporate world. Because now there's a huge gap between the two mm -hmm. and then I think they, it can able to assist, and it also uh, uh, assist in terms of the the funding pool because the corporate world when they come in, they will able to to subsidize in terms of bursaries, 
then now not everyone is going to be uh, looking at the only the NSFAS to post, but we have more uh, crowdfunding and assist even the mid uh, gap on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johan. Mr. Johan's submission are very interesting, and we think that um, they might make a change into the near future. But currently, what we're facing is job insecurity. Not in the sense that we're studying things that are very irrelevant for the labor market, but in the sense that can the labor market that we want to enter into as the young people, can it withstand the economic trivialities that are in, that are in the economic space right now? Do you think that most companies are geared up to survive any economic backlash or any, any, any economic negative growth? I don't think so, because at the moment, um, at the rate that we're having graduates come out of university, there are quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually very bad for us to promise them that they're going to get a job, whereas, like we've said before, they're sitting at home with their degrees. You know, we just need somebody to come and help us start something new. Mm -hmm. We cannot depend on employment. Let's let's teach people to be self-employed. Mm -hmm. um, let the corporate world also run some programs. You know, let them help the young people to actually help them in turn. Do you understand no, what I'm saying? Let like them it. let them have a place, a platform where they can practice their skills and practice their crafts that they've studied. That way they can actually add to the economic growth. Thank you, thank you. So in this discussion, what I've picked up is that what we are confronted with in, the, in, in terms of unemployment is this catch-22 or the red tape and bottlenecks of youth going into the labor market. And we have highlighted um, that um, most of the companies are not, are not economically resilient to ensure that they are sustainable over the long run as the economy doesn't grow, and that there is a curriculum mismatch between what the labor market wants and what our educational curriculum gives to us. And that causes a lot of job insecurity for us. But going into one of the other aspects that we as the youth wanted to touch on was the highly emphasized and highly talked about fourth industrial revolution. So in light of the fact that um, there is no there is no job resilience from what we see what we observe in the markets do you think that the fourth industrial revolution can take us to what the agenda 2063 envisions that we can have in africa we want do we think that Ms. lerato this is the instrument for change in africa um looking at the high employment unemployment rate i don't think we are yet ready for the fourth industrial revolution. I think we should first sort out the unemployment rate first, and then that's when we can approach for fourth industrial revolution, because we're gonna lose more jobs. Like, using fourth industrial revolution, it will affect us a lot, because if I create a car that um, is created by a robot, who's gonna buy that car if someone out there doesn't have a job? So I think we should first deal with the unemployment rate. Let's focus on it. And then when we're done with it, that's when we can approach the fourth industrial revolution. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Sander, there's, there's a fear that robots are going to take over every job that exists with the fourth industrial revolution. And there are hypothetical scenarios that economists have been talking about. For instance, making attacks on robots. So if the, tech, if the robot is going to replace you in your workplace, what people are suggesting that, so it should pay its SARS because it's replacing you as well with, with the tech system. Do you think that that's something workable in the near future? Texting robots. Texting robots. How are they going to control texting robots? So the idea is that um, according to their work rate, people are also paid according to their work rate. So if the robot works for seven hours, then that same money that the person was going to be paid in wages should be the, the same money that the robot is getting. And that's where it's going to be taxed. So do you understand that this hypothetical scenario is just something the economists are playing with out there? I think that that's a negative mindset. <laughs> uh, I think the focus really should be on skilling people because as Ooh, Mr. Koza had said that there's a mismatch between the skills that people have and the economy. 
it's it's no it's no secret that the world is getting more technologically advanced right as the minister of 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 communication from Kenya had said that even businesses they 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 put their work online because it is cheaper for them it is more efficient and they don't want physical bodies in the building because that means more money that means rental and and so forth so i think the problem is setting the mindset on the fact that human body is not going to be needed that's not possible all we need to do is to find skills the the rare skills that um that's needed to drive the economy and our mindset should then be on upskilling people if there's a, a new a new uh system that's coming into 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 the bank for instance instead of actually people going there and striking learn how to use the new system so that you're not replaced by a robot as technology gets more advanced we as humans need to also upskill and advance ourselves because i don't think there's going to be ever a time where humans are not needed on earth i understand that uh mr koza so we understand that um the fourth industrial revolution is inevitable it's only a matter of when and a matter of how so given that it's coming so what sectors of society do you think that we should prioritize in implementing the fourth industrial revolution uh, look mawanda me like sasanda uh, said that uh, uh, we need to skill people but like you said also that uh, uh, it's, a, it's a revolution remember revolution is not coming as an invitation mm -hmm. you don't need an invitee to form part of it either you stand it still uh, hit you either you fight back but i think when we skilled it also we must able to take in mind like what happens for example in german when german uh, they creating the german machines um the labor with very few then they needed more hands so that because there was a high demand of those cars then they, that's why they moved to robot which they assembled the cars the, the Mercedes PM stuff so that they can able to meet the demand of them so it depends on us are we saying on this for uh, uh, for are are we going to be the consumer or are we going to be the producer if we want to be a producer we should go and create a uh, more work we must able to send more of our own young people to other outside the world to go and learn different in different countries how to to be a producer on it how to create something out of it if you can check in south africa we don't have even one cell phone created by us we don't have even one car created by south africa the only thing we just assemble it we need young people who can create from the scratch and that is how the only way is to go out and we need legislation it must be legislated because now it's not legislated for instance if you go to retail now retail is while more young people they are in retail they are working there they are employees and if not legislated and then imagine when we went to any mcdonald and it's the only machine that is serving you where will the young people be but if it's legislated it can able to be identified that this is the only portion that it must be so i think you must not be in one field but in all over overall the field there must be legislation if you can check the mining industry they manage to legislate it there is a certain limit that where you can use your own robots and everything there is a certain limit whereby it must be a labor woman so i think in all all in all it the effort are as much as we are facing it we must be arming it in terms of legislation it we must legislate it so that whenever it hit us we can able to hit back on it that is my view in terms of the for us no thank you um mr onelena given all the submissions and we can deduce that people are very fearful but do you think that there are um future proof jobs do you think that there are jobs that are going nowhere no robot can overtake just just entertain me on that question definitely not um we are in need of the fourth industrial revolution i mean the online space is a very huge platform although we're facing issues of you know the online space not being able to be regulated but i do feel that that's where the youth can actually get empowerment from that's where they can get their next jobs that's where they can start their business that's a very good platform actually for south africa to do business with the rest of the world and not just the rest of the world but the rest of africa as well that would give us a, a, uh, africa growth as a continent as well 
if we can just get the corporate and government to work together to actually help these young people to get skilled. I mean, how many people do we have producing memes in South Africa which are trending on Twitter and um, various other social media? That just shows you the talent and the extent of thinking outside the box that South African youth have. Now let's let them utilize that and use it on this online space and let's welcome the fourth industrial revolution and not see it as such a bad thing. Okay, now thank you for that submission. So what I get here is that everyone is very keen on having um, Afro-futurists Afro take up the space. What we also find is that we only need um, a skills revolution which goes back to what we have been talking about in the first session when we were covering education that we need more upskilling of people in our skills revolution. Now coming to a more pertinent issue and that is very rife in our society is that of gender-based society, gender-based violence. Um, I understand that um, the Miss, Miss Universe has been made an ambassador for, for, this, for this initiative. Um, so what would you like her to pursue in her ambassadorship for gender-based violence? Um, Gender-based violence is a very serious issue in South Africa where more women are being killed, brutally killed. I feel like Miss Universe should impact, uh, should focus more on um, addressing it. How should we stop it? How should we um, end it? Because it's really getting ugly, it really, it's really getting nasty. Um, I think Miss Universe can um, address it, just address it. Why? Why are men being so brutal towards women? Because this thing is really serious. It's really getting out of hand. Because I don't feel safe. Even though when I'm walking around, I don't feel safe. I don't know who will attack me behind um, and molest me. So it's it's really getting out of hand. It's it's a serious issue. It's a serious matter where government, communities should work together to stop this. Mrs. Sandra, so I pick up that there is male brutality and those are those all feed into toxic masculinity. So is there anything that you would like to say to men in, in general? Um, first of all, I think that as a country we need to to focus on moral regeneration. A lot of things are happening because we have lost moral regeneration, we have lost Ubuntu. Um, in as much as we can say that, but at the same time we can also look at the picture of the statistics that we are the most um, uh, geno what? genocide, yeah, we are number one in the world. Those, those statistics can also be debated because you look at things like how safe do women feel reporting uh, their, their, their abusers to the police, et cetera, et cetera. But those statistics on their own are scary. There's, there's nothing I can say to men. I'm a woman, so women have been pleading and begging with men, protesting naked showing that just because I'm naked doesn't mean you have a right to my body. So as a woman, there's absolutely nothing I can say to men. Men need to speak to themselves and to each other. Briefly, Mr. Koza, what's your take on gender-based violence and what we, what we should do to mitigate it? Uh, I think, like Sasanda said, that moral regeneration is one needed uh, aspect. I think most of it, uh, we, we need also to, to put pressure more especially to religious leaders and also traditional leaders because most of it is religious and cultural the, because the way it is being uh, uh, what you call uh, what the way it's being translated it, it, it people they missed the, 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 the concept is what because they if you can check a uh, uh, cultural they say uh, uh, a man uh, cannot cry in the title so those things, some of it, they misinterpreted. We, we need to go back and then able to clarify it. And as early as from the, the, the high school level, we need to say if we are being abused or something wrong from within as a young boy, you must be taken out as a young boy. I think if we can teach more of the young boys than the way we are doing, because if we can check societal now, 
we, we, most of us in our society, we know the victims, but we don't know the perpetrators. How come in the society you can't know people who, who, are, who are doing those things, but you know people who are victims? We must be able to say, how can we teach a, a, a boy child to, 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 to handle in life and also to face a woman? Not that they always, because whenever you go to tell us a boy is, is more in terms of superiority than a woman, then they must be able to know that they are equal. So if we can teach it from there, coming out, we can reap it in the future, that all the, 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 all the, this what's happening can be able to decline. But in the currently, religious must be in the forefront, including of cultural leaders or traditional leaders, in trying, because everything now, they just pay it to government, that government must be the only one who's fighting the GPV. They must be in the forefront, teaching it in the churches, Everywhere they must be able to teach them, make sure that they understand what does it mean to, to, to do these things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have now come to the end of our session, but just quickly, Rato, in just ten seconds, just tell us what do you th what do you, how what do you think um, Cyril Ramaphosa t should say on the sauna? should uh, um, highlight or outline the issue of the state-owned enti entities how long like how long will be the, the state-owned entities um, the in unemployment and the gender-based violence Sandra, what would you like to see on the sauna? Uh, I'd like to see plans of action plans of yes plans of not just announcements uh, my take uh, for SONA is that uh, the economy, how going to uh, turn around the economy, because if you can check now, it's more worse, and also the SOE, and how can able to, because now most of it is like in the away state, what is the plan that does on take to change it, and also the educational funding, most institutions are in protest, how will you mitigate there and able to close the gap between the last the issue of uh, unemployment. Uh, I think that one is a serious issue that uh, it, it can be left unattached. I agree with Mr. Koza, the issue of unemployment, the president needs to really address that matter and he needs to find a way to engage with the youth um, into government programs and also just self-employment programs. Lastly, I would also like him to touch on the issue of gender-based uh, violence and femicide because it's really something that is really dragging our, econ our economy down and we need our citizens to feel safe. We cannot be living in a country where our citizens' lives feel threatened, particularly women and children. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end of our session. Um, I appreciate all the panelists members who were with us today and I wish that we could have more opportunities to find out what the youth think and what the youth want to see in their, in their country. So thank you very much.